Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to A Song of Ice and Fire. In our last video, we explained why we think Aegon decided to take it upon himself to unite Westeros, transforming it from a place where two or three of the Seven Kingdoms were at war with one another at any given moment, to a single kingdom of peace, prosperity, and justice. Well, sort of. Technically, Aegon only managed to conquer the six northernmost kingdoms, so that could really only be said for his new kingdom, but Dorne eluded him, which at first we found impressive. But after considering the great cost they paid for their independence, and the fact that they were resisting a man that didn't intend to change their customs, traditions, or way of life, it seems to us that the only thing they accomplished by resisting was maintaining House Martell's title as the Princes and Princesses of Dorne. On paper, anyways. Our last Dorne vs. the Dragons video brought us right up to the point where Aegon unleashed his dragons on the Dornish seats, in retaliation for the Dornish cutting sword hands off of Oris Baratheon, who was Aegon's best friend, and his men. The Dornish, being the progressive and honorable principality they are, hit back by killing thousands of small folk and burning their crops. Classy. So today we will be picking up with what Aegon did in response, showcasing more of the moral and just ways of the Dornish. So, let's do this. So again, the Targaryens turn to their dragons, unleashing their fury upon Starfall and Skyreach and Hellholt. It was at Hellholt where the Dornish had their greatest success against the Targaryens. A bolt from a scorpion pierced the eye of Meraxes, and the great dragon and the queen who rode upon it fell from the sky. In her death throes, the dragon destroyed the castle's highest tower and part of the curtain wall. Queen Rainey's body was never returned to King's Landing. Whether Rainey's Targaryen outlived her dragon remains a matter of dispute. Some say that she lost her seat and fell to her death. Others, that she was crushed beneath Meraxes in the castle yard. A few accounts claim the queen survived her dragon's fall only to die a slow death by torment in the dungeons of the Ullers. The true circumstances of her demise will likely never be known, but the histories record that Rhaenys Targaryen, sister and wife to King Aegon I, perished at the Hellholt in Dorne in the tenth year after the conquest. Okay. So this seems as good a time as any to discuss one of House Nymeros Martell's most loyal bannermen, the Ullers of Hellholt. The Ullers were Andal adventurers who raised their seat beside the stinking waters along the sulfurous banks of the Brimstone River. Their close relationship with House Nymeros Martell traces back to the days of Nymeria, when they helped Mors Martell in Nymeria complete their conquest of Dorne by defeating the closest thing Dorne had to a true High King, Yorick Ironwood, the Blood Royal. In fact, after Mors Martell's death, Nymeria apparently held the Ullers in such high esteem that she took the aged Lord Uller for her second husband, but had no children by him. The Ullers of the aptly named Hellholt have a dark and dangerous reputation. According to Ariane, the Ullers are half mad and the other half are worse. Now, while there aren't any tangible examples of Uller brutality in the series, it would seem that George really wanted to make sure that the world understood just how insane these guys actually are, so he decided to include a nice little tale about the Andal adventurers of Hellholt in his official app. According to the app, when the Ullers first arrived in Dorne, 
they decided that they really, really, really wanted to live in the absolute worst place available, at the headwaters of the Brimstone River, otherwise known as a place that smells like sulfur or rotten eggs. So, they decided to have the local lords over to their place for a little feast, but instead of food, they served their guests with fire and burned their own keep to the ground with their guests inside. Charming, right? It seems to me that this might have even been a greater violation of guest right than the Red Wedding. It should also be noted that the Ullers were so proud of what they did, it became the inspiration for their coat of arms. Which means two of House Martell's besties, the Ullers and Tolans, take enormous pride in their most despicable acts. So much so that they wanted to make sure everyone knew exactly what they did, so they placed symbolic representations of these despicable actions on their banners. The two years that followed were later called the Years of the Dragon's Wrath. Grief-stricken at the death of their beloved sister, King Aegon and Queen Visenya set ablaze every castle, keep, and holdfast in Dorne at least once, save for Sunspear and the Shadow City. Why this is so remains a matter of conjecture. In Dorne, it was said the Targaryens feared that Princess Maria had some cunning means of slaying dragons, something she had purchased from Lys. Likelier, however, is Archmaester Timothy's suggestion in his conjectures that the Targaryens hoped to turn the rest of the Dornish, who suffered so much destruction, against the Martells, who were spared. If this is true, it may explain the letters dispatched from the marshes to the Dornish houses, urging them to surrender and claiming that the Martells had betrayed them by buying their safety from the Targaryens at the expense of the rest of Dorne. Regardless, the last and least glorious phase of the First Dornish War then began. The Targaryens placed prices on the heads of the Dornish lords, and half a dozen and more were killed by assassins, though only two of the killers ever lived to collect their reward. The Dornish responded in kind, and many were the pitiless deaths that followed. Even in the heart of King's Landing, no one was safe. Lord Fell was smothered in a brothel, and King Aegon himself was attacked on three separate occasions. When Queen Visenya and an escort were set upon, two of her guards died before she cut down the last villain herself with Dark Sister. Worse occurred at the hands of the Will of Will, whose deeds we need not recount. They are infamous enough and still remembered, especially in Fountain and Old Oak. So, here you can see that Aegon and Visenya clearly decided that they weren't going to play around with Dorne anymore, and unleashed the full fury of their dragons on every Dornish castle, keep, and holdfast. It does seem a bit odd that these allegedly poor lords and landed knights had the funds to continuously rebuild their scorched castles, but I guess that's where their discreet participation in the slave trade might come in. And does anyone else find it a bit suspicious that Lys, a former member of the Valyrian Freehold, supposedly had weapons that were designed to kill dragons? Hmm. As a city that was part of the Valyrian Freehold, you would think that they wouldn't be devoting their time to designing weapons to protect themselves from Valyria's dragons, as they had the ability to call on Valyria's dragons for assistance. This would almost make you think that they were the enemies of Valyria. But why? Most likely because the Valyrians didn't permit the Lycini to buy and sell little girls and boys into sex slavery, which seems to be their most profitable business at this point. This might also grant us the closest thing we'll ever get to an explanation as to how every single dragon lord in Essos that managed to escape the doom died in its almost immediate aftermath. The free cities wanted the giscari style slave trade back and were prepared when the doom came to make sure that no dragon lords were left to stop them. And the fact that it seems to have happened simultaneously in other free cities as well 
definitely hints at this being a coordinated effort to rid themselves of the quote-unquote Valyrian shackles. And what was left afterwards? Every single free city established by Valyria is now intricately involved in growing fat and rich from the slave trade the Valyrians seem to have prohibited them from being involved in. Dorne was a blighted, burning ruin by this time. And still the Dornish hid and fought from the shadows, refusing to surrender. Even the small folk refused to yield, and the toll in lives was uncountable. When Princess Miria at last passed away in 13 AC, her throne passed to her son, the aged and failing Prince Nymor. He had had enough of war and sent a delegation led by his daughter, Princess Daria, to King's Landing. This delegation carried the skull of Meraxes with them as a gift for the king. It was ill-received by many, Queen Visenya and Oris Baratheon among them, and Lord Oakhart urged that Daria be sent to the meanest of brothels to service any man who would have her. But King Aegon Targaryen would not countenance such an act, and instead listened to her words. Dorne wanted peace, according to Daria, but the peace of two kingdoms no longer at war, not the peace between a vassal and a lord. Many urged his grace against this, and the phrase, no peace without submission, was often heard in the halls of the Aegon Fort. It was claimed that the king would look weak should he agree to such a demand, and that the lords of the Reach and Stormlands, who had suffered so much for his cause, would be angered. Swayed by such considerations, it is said King Aegon was determined to refuse the offer, until Princess Daria placed in his hands a private letter from her father, Prince Nymor. Aegon read it upon the Iron Throne, and men say that when he rose, his hand was bleeding. So hard had he clenched it. He burned the letter and departed immediately on Balerion's back for Dragonstone. When he returned the next morning, he agreed to the peace and signed a treaty to that effect. What the letter contained none knows to this day, though many have speculated. Did Nymor reveal that Rainy still lived, broken and mutilated, and that he would end her suffering if Aegon ended hostilities? Was the letter ensorcelled? Did he threaten to take all the wealth of Dorne to hire the faceless men to kill Aegon's young son and heir, Aenys? These questions shall never be answered, it seems. Okay. So we've stayed away from Rainey's death until now, because up until this point, there really wasn't much to go on. But when looking at what Aegon did when he received that letter from Prince Nymor, there is really only one conclusion to draw. Somehow, Aegon managed to squeeze this letter so hard that it cut his hand. Then he got on Balerion, flew to Dragonstone, presumably to consult with his sister Visenya, then returned and accepted their proposal for peace when it was said that he had no intention to do so prior to receiving this letter. There is only one explanation for this. Rainy survived her fall at Hellholt, and since it would seem that, given their reputation, the others were almost certainly among the Dornish lords that had at some point perfected the art of keeping their captives alive in spite of the fact that they were literally cutting them into pieces, it seems an almost certainty that the Ullers had been systematically removing piece after piece of Rainies for the better part of three years, and Prince Nymor decided that the Ullers had had enough fun, as he had come up with a way to use the fact that she was somehow still breathing to broker a peace. Given that this letter must have included something that gave Aegon proof of life, and add to that the fact that Aegon and Visenya loved their sister, they would have had no choice but to give in to the Dornish demands, because refusal to do so would mean their beloved sister would have to endure even more suffering than she already had. 
It should also be noted that Aegon's advisors wanted to send Princess Daria to the city's worst brothel to have her pleasure any man that wished to have her. But Aegon wouldn't stand for it, once again showing himself to be an honorable and just leader. The result, however, was a peace that lasted through the troubles of the Vulture King and beyond. There were other Dornish wars, to be sure, and even during times of peace, Raiders out of Dorne continued to descend from the Red Mountains in search of plunder in the richer, greener lands to the north and west. So, here it is, in plain English, that no matter what accord you strike with the Dornish, they will not live up to it. These guys are essentially iron-born reavers, except they tend to raid over land. Even when you think that you've made peace with them, they will continue to raid and pillage anywhere they think they can get away with it. These people, for all intents and purposes, do not sow, just like their ironborn counterparts. Given the fact that the pirates and slavers of the Stepstones seem to leave Dorne completely unscathed, it seems extremely likely that Sunspear actually controls them, and just about everything they do is exactly what the Martells told them to. These people bring just about nothing to the table, except death and destruction, and as such, they were completely unwilling to be ruled by a man such as Aegon Targaryen, who wouldn't tolerate such behavior within his domains. Prince Corin Martell did lead the Dornish to fight in support of the Triarchy when they warred with Prince Daemon Targaryen and the Sea Snake over the Stepstones. During the Dance of the Dragons, both sides courted the Dornishmen, but Prince Corin refused to take part. Dorn has danced with dragons before, he was reported to have said in response to Sir Otto Hightower's letter. I would sooner sleep with scorpions. So, here you can see that the Martells had absolutely no interest in seeing the Iron Throne gain control of their precious pirates and slavers of the Stepstones. So, they allied themselves with the slavers of Essos to make sure that didn't happen. Then, when the Dance of the Dragons began, the Dornish sat back and watched their enemies destroy one another. And even more importantly, destroy their dragons. It was not until the ascent of King Darren I that the Treaty of Eternal Peace proved to be less than eternal. And we know the cost of that. The young dragon's conquest of Dorne was a glorious feat, rightly celebrated in song and story. But it lasted less than a summer, and cost many thousands of lives, including that of the bold young knight himself. It was left to Darren's brother and successor, King Baelor I the Blessed, to make the peace, and the cost of that was grievous as well. It should be noted that although it is touched on elsewhere, Yendel really downplays how Darren died here. After defeating the Dornish for the second time in as many years, a parley was called for to dictate the terms of the Dornish surrender. And when Darren showed up for this parley, they killed him under a peace banner, and wounded and captured the legendary Aemon the Dragon Knight, his cousin. Damon's younger brother, Baylor, who was later nicknamed the Blessed, walked all the way to Sunspear barefoot to negotiate a peace between Dorne and the Iron Throne, which he somehow managed to do. He then decided to walk all the way back to King's Landing, and asked that the Prince of Dorne order the release of his cousin Aemon, which he did. And being a Dornish promise, Aemon the Dragon Knight was not simply handed over to Baylor when he arrived at the Will. Instead, Baylor was forced to walk across a pit of vipers to free him, which obviously went well. The later attempt by King Aegon IV, the Unworthy, to invade Dorne with quote-unquote dragons of his own design is hardly worthy of discussion. It was a mad folly, start to finish and ended in humiliation. It was Aegon's son, King Darren II the Good, who finally brought Dorne into the realm. 
not with iron and fire, but with soft words and smiles and a pair of well-considered marriages, and a solemn treaty that granted the Dornish princes their style and their privileges, and guaranteed that their own laws and customs should always prevail in Dorn. Another thing that Yandel sort of breezed through, but covered elsewhere, was the fact that these concessions, coupled with Aegon the Unworthy's blatant riling up of the Lords of the Reach, Stormlands, and the Marches against his son, who opposed many of his more moronical ideas, directly led to the next Targaryen civil war, the Blackfyre Rebellions. So, it would be wise to take great care when receiving gifts from the Martells, as it would seem that they, like their buddy Littlefinger, are in the habit of giving poisoned gifts. And even though it appeared that they had given the gift of a united realm, what they had really accomplished was sowing the seeds for yet another rebellion. <laughs> <laughs>